So I now have the pleasure of introducing today's keynote speaker, uh, Professor Jason Hickel, hopefully with us online. Jason, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So Jason Hickel is an economic anthropologist and professor at the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and a visiting senior fellow at the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics. He's also a fellow at the Royal Society of Arts and associate editor of the journal World Development. In addition to his academic commitments, Jason Hickel serves on several key international bodies. Among other, he is on the Statistical Advisory Panel for the UN uh, Human Development Report and on the advisory board uh, of the Green New Deal for Europe. He also appears in and writes regularly for different news channels. Those of us who read The Guardian may, for example, have come his, across his columns there. Uh, Hickel's research has global inequality as it at its core, both as concerns contemporary societies and from an historical perspective. In his work, for example, the 2017 book, The Divide, A Brief Guide to Global Inequality and Its Solutions, he draws long historical lines from pre-capitalist and pre-colonial times to more recent developments, for example, related to debt and what he calls the planned economy of misery, showing us root causes of poverty and unequal distribution. In his uh, most recent writings, he has turned towards ecological economics and degrowth in particular. Personally, his work caught my attention when I was preparing some teaching activities on post-development for a master's course and read his book, Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World. It's the most fascinating work, not only because it brings to light the grotesque workings of extract extractivist capitalism over time, and its consequences for livelihoods and people across the globe, but also for the imaginative remedies it proposes, proposes to heal our societies, provide new beginnings, so to speak, and thus new hope. Jason Hickel, we are extremely happy to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, it's an honor for me to be with you all this morning. Uh, so just to give you a brief overview of my talk, uh, I'm going to reflect on prevailing narratives in international development, which hold that poorer countries can and will catch up with richer countries through the process of capitalist growth. I'm going to argue that catch up developments is an illusion and is impossible for several reasons having to do with the structure of the capitalist world economy. First, capitalism in the core states relies on patterns of net appropriation from the periphery in order to stabilize growth and accumulation. This dynamic, I'll argue, produces global inequality and precludes the possibility of catch-up development. Second, the high levels of resource and energy use in the core states are incompatible with a habitable earth system and cannot be universalized. Okay, so in light of these realities, it becomes clear that achieving any meaningful convergence and any real progress in human development will require fundamental changes indeed revolutionary changes to the structure of the world economy. And it's crucial to realize that such a transformation will not be handed down from above. It will require a radical anti-colonial movement for the 21st century. Okay. See how we go here. Okay. So over the past several years, public discourse has settled on the narrative that capitalist globalization has been driving a dramatic convergence in the world economy with poor countries catching up to rich countries. The brutal polarization of the colonial era is behind us, the story goes, as globalization opens a future of shared prosperity for all. If we carry on with the status quo and press on the accelerator of capitalist growth, poverty will disappear and the gap between rich countries and poor countries will close forever. So does this narrative hold water? Well, let's begin by looking at inequality between the core and the periphery of the world system, or the global north and the global south. For the core here, I refer to the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, Japan, Korea, and the rich countries of Europe. For the global south, I mean the rest of the world, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, uh, and also including China. If we look at the Gini coefficient, which is the most common inequality metric, and the one that the dominance narrative relies on, and if we weight by population, we see that 
there has indeed been a slight reduction of inequality since 1960. Okay, but there are, uh, there are two things to note here. First, this decline in the north-south Gini coefficient is due entirely to one country, China. And this is significant because China has successfully resisted the key tenets of the Washington Consensus that have been imposed on most of the rest of the global south over the past several decades. So if we take China out of the equation, the north-south inequality has in fact increased since 1960. And if we break this down by country, we see that for most countries in the global south, in fact, 73% of them, inequality with the global north has increased over this period. But there's a second thing to understand about this data. The Gini coefficient is a measure of relative inequality. This is important. This means that when the national incomes of poorer countries increase at a faster rate than those of richer countries, this is interpreted as a reduction of inequality, even if the actual gap between the two continues to increase. Now, it's not uncommon for growth rates in poorer countries to be higher than in richer countries. In fact, this is expected to occur, even though, as we've just seen, for most countries, it has in fact not occurred, contrary to the assumptions of neoclassical economics. Growth is expected to be higher in poor countries because international and domestic capital can push quickly into non-commodified parts of the economy or take advantage of extractive frontiers, often under weak regulatory regimes. And of course, adding a given quantity of production to a small economy yields a larger growth rate than if the same quantity is added to a large economy. But these patterns do not necessarily lead to actual catch-up or convergence. In fact, the opposite is normally true, okay? Take a look at this graph. This graph shows the per capita income of the global north and the global south since 1960. And note that the south here includes China. As you can see, the north-south income gap has more than tripled over this period. In 1960, the average person in the global north had $12,000 more than in the South, whereas today they have $39,000 more per year. In absolute terms, the global economy is clearly more unequal today than at any time in history. Uh, whatever we might say about the North-South trends, it makes very little sense to describe this as catch-up, much less convergence, according to any common sense definition of these terms. Indeed, to repurpose a phrase once used by Lant Pritchett, what's happening is divergence big time. Here's the reality. The vast majority of the per capita income growth in the world economy since 1960 has been captured by the global north. Northern incomes have increased seven times more than Southern incomes and 12 times more if we take China out of the equation. This is egregious when you consider that the additional income captured by the north is superfluous to need, whereas if it was allocated to the south, it could be used instead to dramatically improve people's lives. Okay. Now, in conventional assessments of global inequality, there are two unspoken assumptions. The first is that each nation is a bounded entity, separate from other countries, and on an endogenous trajectory of development. Indeed, this assumption is embedded in the Gini index and other metrics of relative inequality, which measure each nation's change in income vis-a-vis -vis their own previous state, rather than against an ideal fair distribution. The second assumption is that poor countries have low income because they produce very little and contribute very little to the world economy. This notion is embedded in the name of GDP itself, gross domestic products, which leads us to believe that a country's GDP reflects the scale of its domestic production and therefore also the scale of its contribution to total global production. But these assumptions conflict dramatically with how the world economy actually works. In reality, the world economy is a highly integrated system and has been for 500 years. This was obvious during colonialism when the core economies relied on resources and labor in the periphery, and it remains true today. My colleagues and I analyzed input-output data and found that the global north relies on production in the global south for 55% of its total material use, okay? So in other words, northern economies are utterly dependent on the global south. This should come as no surprise to anyone who pays any attention at all to the nature of the North's corporate supply chains. <clears throat> Production of Apple iPhones, for instance, happens in the global South with Southern resources and Southern labor, but the profits from this production are captured overwhelmingly as GDP in the global North. As for the notion that the South produces little and contributes little to the world economy, this is also incorrect. In fact, the majority of production in the world economy takes place in the global South. 
including 82% of total material production, 78% of all land-based production, and 81% of all industrial labor. Note that these figures are quite close to the South's share of the world population, okay? Uh, so what that means, in other words, is that we can say that the global product is collectively generated, but the yields of that product <clears throat> are for some reason unevenly captured. And this is what global in the, the absolute inequality data reveals, and this is why it is important. Clearly the North is disproportionately capturing value that is being produced in the South. Another way of putting this is to say that the global North exercises a disproportionate share of purchasing power over the global products. So we're not dealing here with a crisis of inequality in the sense that it is normally understood by neoclassical economists. We are dealing with a crisis of exploitation and appropriation. I'll say more about this in a minute, uh, but first I want to highlight another important dimension of inequality in the world economy, and it has to do with resource use, okay? So take a look at this graph. This graph shows global resource use over the past half century. Metals, cement, forests, fish, fossil fuels, everything. All of the material resources that the economy extracts and uses every year. The red line in the graph is what industrial ecologists say is the maximum sustainable boundary. So that's 50 billion tons per year. And as you can see, we shot past that threshold in the late 1990s. And as of 2020, not visible in this graph, we are now consuming 100 billion tons per year, overshooting the maximum boundary by a factor of two. This is a problem because excess resource extraction is the major driver of ecological damage in the Earth's system. It is responsible for 90% of biodiversity loss and other key ecological pressure indicators. And I should mention here briefly that resource use is in turn being driven by economic growth. There's a very tight coupling between GDP and material flows. For the past half century, politicians have promised us that more efficient technology and a shift to services would decouple growth from resource use. But in fact, the opposite has happened. Over the past two decades, a recoupling has occurred. The global economy is becoming more resource intensive, not less. And there are several reasons for this, but that's a story for another time. I won't focus on that here. What I wanna get across here is that ecological breakdown is being driven overwhelmingly by the core economies, right? This graph here shows per capita resource use by country income group. The red line is the maximum sustainable level rendered in per capita terms. We see that rich economies on the far right of the graph consume on average 28 tons of resources per person per year, which is four times over the maximum boundary. And by the way, vastly in excess of what is required to meet human needs even at a high standard. That's, that's an important point. Now, why is it that rich countries have such extreme levels of resource use? Well, at the same time, it's evidence that large numbers of their citizens cannot make ends meet. And this is particularly true in countries like the US and the UK. It appears to be a paradox. The reason is because under capitalism, decisions about what to produce, how to use resources, and who benefits from the surplus that we generate, all of this is controlled by a small number of extremely wealthy individuals the 1% who own the majority of corporate shares and who elect the directors of firms. And of course, what they do with this power is they decide we should produce things that maximize their profits, things like advertising and SUVs and fossil fuels, rather than things like public health care and public transit. The result is that we have a system that simultaneously overuses resources and fails to meet people's basic needs. And this is a major problem. Meanwhile, let us note that lower income countries consume a very small quantity of resources and remain well within sustainable levels. In most cases, they actually need to increase resource use in order to meet human needs at a good standard, okay? Now we can see the very same extreme inequalities when it comes to energy use. The core economies on the right here use vastly more energy than what is required for human needs and vastly more energy than the rest of the world. And again, all of this energy is being used to fuel a production system that is controlled by the, by the rich and geared around maximizing their profit and, and elite accumulation, not around what is required for human well-being. As a result, the core economies also have very high levels of emissions. Indeed, we know that they are responsible for the vast majority, around 90%, of cumulative emissions in excess of the safe planetary boundary. In other words, the emissions that are causing climate breakdown. 
And this is a, dy a dynamic that we explore in this recent paper in the Lancet of Planetary Health. The core countries have effectively colonized the atmosphere for their own enrichments with devastating consequences for the rest of the world, for all of life on earth, and specifically for communities in the global south, which suffer the majority of the damages from climate change. It would be difficult to overstate the scale of this injustice. Now, what I want to highlight here is that in addition to being extremely unequal, resource and energy use in the world economy has clear colonial dimensions as well. Here's the key facts. Growth in the global north relies on a massive net appropriation of resources from the global south. Okay? In other words, the world economy is characterized by a net flow from south to north, from the periphery to the core. You cannot see this flow when you're looking at GDP data because GDP creates the illusion that value is all domestically produced. It obscures the dynamics of value capture. This dynamic only becomes clear when we look at the physical flows in the world economy. So in a new paper published in Global Environmental Change, we calculated the full scale of net appropriation from the global south in empirical terms. And the results are really quite staggering. Let me give you a sense for what this looks like very briefly. First, uh, we found in the year 2015, the last year of our data, a net flow of 12 billion tons of embodied raw materials is appropriated from the global south each year. And by embodied here, I mean materials that are involved in the production of traded goods. So to put this in perspective, 12 billion tons is double the total mass of resources extracted from the continent of Africa each year. So this quantity is transferred to the global north for free, in other words, without any equivalent compensation. Okay. In addition to this, uh, 21 exajoules of embodied energy is net appropriated from the global south each year. To put this in perspective, that amount of energy would be enough to develop the infrastructure required to provide healthcare, uh, education, housing, heating, cooling, public transit, commuting, and other, uh, sorry, computing, and other necessities to the entire population of the global south, all 6.5 billion people, meeting human needs at a good standard, but instead it is used to fuel corporate growth in the global north. 820 million hectares of embodied land is not appropriated from the south each year. That's twice the size of India, and that amount of land could be used to provide nutritious food for four to six billion people, depending on land productivity and diet, but instead it is used to produce things like sugar for Coca-Cola and beef for McDonald's consumed in the global north. Okay, and then finally, uh, 188 million person years of embodied labor is net appropriated from the South each year. That's nearly the size of Latin America's entire workforce, okay? So a standing army the size of Latin America's workforce could be used to staff hospitals and schools and produce food and goods for local needs in the global South. But instead, this army of workers works full-time year after year, churning out tech gadgets in fast fashion for Northern corporations, right? This is not a small thing. Our results show that, that growth in the global North depends utterly on this imperialist appropriation. It depends on literally sucking the life out of ecosystems and human bodies and communities in the global south. Now, what this means is that the social and ecological impacts of northern growth are offshored or externalized to the global south. That's where the damage happens at the resource frontiers. Southern ecosystems and communities are effectively being plundered to support continued growth in the north. This is the cause not only of environmental degradation, but also of mass poverty and human deprivation in the global south. My colleagues and I calculated that the value of, of the total appropriated resources from the south each year is equivalent to about $10.8 trillion in northern prices, which would be enough to end extreme poverty 70 times over. But instead, the south is maintained in conditions of misery in order to shore up the possibility of continued capitalist growth in the global north. In other words, the dual crisis of ecological breakdown and mass deprivation in the global south is an effect of imperialist appropriation in the world economy. Okay. Now, in a few minutes, I'm going to explain what's going on here, uh, why and how these net flows occur. But first, I want to establish a broader point. I want to argue that imperialist appropriation along these lines is not incidental. 
It is a structurally necessary feature of capitalist growth. Here's the key thing to understand. Under capitalism, growth is not about increasing production to meet specific human needs. It is about increasing production in order to generate and accumulate surplus value. That is the overriding objective. And this is important because people have a tendency to think of capitalism as simply a system of markets and trade. But of course, markets and trade existed for thousands of years before capitalism. So what makes capitalism distinctive is that it is organized around and dependent on perpetual expansion for the sake of perpetual accumulation. Now, in order to sustain perpetual expansion and accumulation, capital requires an ever rising quantity of inputs at the lowest possible price. And to achieve this, capital has to find ways of cheapening labor and resources. Now, one option is to sabotage your domestic resource base and your domestic working class by cutting protections on labor in the environment. But of course, this hurts people. And sooner or later, you're likely to face something like a revolution. If you want to avoid this backlash, and indeed, if you are under pressure to improve the conditions of your working class, your only other option is to sabotage some third party who is not in a position to fight back. You need some kind of outside where you can exploit resources and labor and externalize social and ecological damages with impunity. And this is where the colonies come in. Capitalism has relied on forms of colonization for the entirety of its 500 year history in order to keep input prices as low as possible. Imperialism is a structurally necessary feature of capitalist growth. This arrangement was obvious, of course, during the colonial period from the, from the late 1400s onward. Capitalism in Western Europe, we know, relied utterly on the appropriation of resources from the colonies and on the use of enslaved and indentured labor on a truly vast scale. Uh, think of the silver plundered from the Andes, the sugar and cotton grown on land appropriated from indigenous Americans, the grain, the rubber, the gold, countless other resources appropriated from Asia and Africa. This global network of extractive industries enabled the economic rise of the imperialist states and underpinned the industrial revolution. Now, this arrangement came under threat in the middle of the 20th century with the rise of the radical anti-colonial movement across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Newly independent governments refused to be plundered by Northern capital and pursued strategies of economic sovereignty, drawing on socialist principles and reclaiming their resources to focus on meeting domestic human needs. They used tariffs and capital controls to protect their markets. They used subsidies to support domestic industries. They used land reform to reclaim territory that had been appropriated by colonial firms, and they ensured better wages for workers. This approach succeeded marvelously at raising incomes and improving welfare. It was a kind of development miracle, but Northern powers were not pleased. Uh, as these progressive policies were cutting off their access to cheap labor and resources in the global South, this became a problem for them uh, as they had relied on, on this kind of appropriation during the colonial period. In other words, it caused the colonial arrangement to unravel, and this triggered a massive crisis of capitalism in the 1970s, which manifest as stagflation. This is not surprising. After all, any significant increase in the price of Southern wages, resources, and goods, and any increase in the South's share of global consumption will, inher will be inherently inflationary for the North and will constrain the North's growth. The unraveling of the colonial arrangement made capital accumulation in the global North very difficult to sustain, especially given that wages were also rising in the North at the same time, thanks to the power of organized labor. So capitalism faced, faced a crisis in the 1970s because it cannot function under conditions of global justice, okay? Now, so the, the, the imperialist states were scrambling for a way to respond, and they did so first by intervening militarily to depose anti-colonial leaders. The list is long and includes several figures that all of us should know. Mohamed Mossadegh in Iran, deposed in 1953 by a Western-backed coup. Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, deposed in 1961 by a Western-backed coup. Jacobo Arabenz in Guatemala, deposed in 1954 by a Western-backed coup. Sukarno in Indonesia, deposed in 1967 by a Western-backed coup. Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, deposed in 1966 by a Western-backed coup. Salvador Allende in Chile, the one we all know, deposed in 1973 by a Western-backed coup. Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, deposed in 1987 
by Western backed coup and many others who were unseated and replaced with right wing dictators, more amenable to Western economic interests, and who rolled back the socialist uh, and anti colonial reforms of the progressive era. But Northern states also intervened by using the World Bank and the IMF to impose structural adjustment programs across the global south in the 1980s and 1990s. Structural adjustment forced governments to cut tariffs and subsidies, cut protections on labor and the environment, cut public spending, and cut public sector employment. This was the sharp edge of neoliberal uh, reform, imposed more viciously on the global south than ever it was in the USA or Britain. And the effect was to destroy the South's economic sovereignty and push the prices of labor and resources back down. Structural adjustment thus restored the imperial arrangement and rescued capitalism in the global North. It restored the rate of corporate profit and it restored the Northern rate of growth. There's an important point to be made here. Progressives quite often like to think of neoliberalism as the disease and they yearn to return to the less rapacious version of capitalism that preceded it. But neoliberalism is not the disease. It is a symptom of the disease. The disease is capitalism. Neoliberalism was imposed because it was necessary to keep capital accumulation afloat in the face of a resurgent South. It was imposed in response to global justice. At the end of the 1970s, the governments of the global North faced a fork in the road. They could either accept a socialist and anti-imperialist South and decent wages at home, and, and therefore abandon capital accumulation, shifting to a, a post-capitalist economy, or they could try to maintain capital accumulation by doing something drastic to restore the basic structure of the imperial arrangements. They chose the latter, and structural adjustment was their mechanism. Now, by undermining the South's attempts to achieve economic sovereignty, structural adjustment put Southern economies back in a position of being dependent on exports to and imports from the global north. But because they also depressed prices in the south, this means that for every unit of embodied resources and labor that they import, they have to export many more units to pay for, to, uh, to pay for it. And this is what we refer to as unequal exchange. And it generates the large net flows of resources from south to north that I described earlier. So this image here shows the unequal exchange of labor between the global south and the global north. The light gray bars on the top show the scale of southern imports from the north, while the dark gray bars at the bottom show the scale of southern exports to the north. For every unit of embodied labor that the south imports from the north, they have to export on average 13 units to pay for it. This reflects truly massive wage inequalities in the world economy. Under capitalism, Southern labor is worth one thirteenth that of Northern labor, not because they are less productive or because they produce less value. In fact, the opposite is true. Southern workers produce more units per hour than Northern workers because they're compelled to work under extremely intense labor regimes. They receive lower wages, not because they are somehow naturally cheap, but because they have been cheapened. And this cheapening means that the core economies benefit from an enormous quantity of additional labor well beyond what their own populations could provide. The same is true for embodied raw materials, uh, which we can see here. For every unit the South imports from the North, they have to export five units to pay for it. The same is true for embodied lands, where again, the ratio is five to one. And the same is true for embodied energy, where the ratio is three to one. So this is the form that imperialism takes in the 21st century. It is an arrangement that enables imperial appropriation without the need, in most cases, for military occupation. Now, the question becomes, how could the World Bank and the IMF get away with imposing policies that were so clearly destructive to the global South? And the answer to this question is that these institutions are deeply undemocratic. There's a tendency in progressive circles to believe that the World Bank and the IMF were founded as progressive institutions back in the 1940s. But in fact, they are colonial institutions founded during colonialism and with colonial principles in mind. The Global South countries at the time were integrated into these institutions on purposefully unequal terms, and they remain fundamentally unequal to this day. So the United States has veto power over all major decisions, and together with the rest of the G7, controls more than half of the votes in the World Bank and the IMF. 
The global south, which has the vast majority of the world's population, has only about one third of the vote. If this was the case in any national parliament, we would all be outraged. We would call it apartheid. And yet apartheid principles operate right at the center of our global economic governance system. The core economies are able to determine the rules of international trade and finance in their own interests. And the imposition of structural adjustment on the global south with all of its consequences was simply an outcome of this privilege. So the GDP of southern countries is not low because they produce little value. It is because their labor, their lands, and their lives are cheapened. This happens through structural adjustment, but that's not the only mechanism for cheapening. It also happens through the exercise of monopsony power in global commodity chains. Lead firms like Apple are so dominant in their sectors that they can basically dictate prices to their suppliers in the global south, forcing them to keep wages uh, at or even below subsistence. It also happens through monopoly power. More than 90% of all patents are owned by Northern firms. So not only do they set prices for their suppliers, they can also set the prices of final sale. And of course, the difference between the prices they pay for their, uh, their suppliers versus the prices they get at the till, at the till it is registered as GDP in the global north. This allows lead firms to appropriate value that is produced in the global south, uh, a pattern that is cemented by the patent rules enshrined in the World Trade Organization. Speaking of which, I should mention here briefly, finally, that the, the WTO is also uh, fundamentally anti-democratic. Bargaining power in the WTO is determined by market size. So the countries that became rich during the colonial period are able to determine the rules of uh, trade in their own interests. So in this sense, in the WTO, inequality begets inequality. So, with the data on imperialist appropriation in mind, we can return to the question of global inequality. When neoclassical economists think about global inequality, they assume that all the world's countries are on the same general trajectory of development. They're just at different stages. The poorer countries of the global south are simply behind. They will be able to follow the same development trajectory as the US and Europe and eventually catch up to them. But once we understand that capitalist growth in the global north depends on patterns of imperialist appropriation, this narrative is revealed to be absurd. Catch-up development cannot occur within a system that is predicated on imperialist appropriation. It physically cannot occur in the context of net south-north flows, and it cannot occur within a system that relies on cheapening southern labor and resources. Saying that poor countries can catch up to rich ones in this context makes about as much sense as saying that Amazon workers can catch up with Jeff Bezos if they just work hard enough. These are not two different trajectories. They are two poles of a distribution within a single economic system. The income gap between the South and the North has continued to widen since the end of colonialism. There's no catch up development happening. And this is not because poor countries are behind. It is because they are exploited. This also allows us to have a different perspective on global, on global poverty, sorry. Poverty in the global South, uh, contrary to dominant narratives, is not some kind of natural condition. It is, it is an effect of imperialist appropriation of Southern resources and labor and productive capacity. It is an effect of price depression, which constrains Southern income and purchasing power and, and consumption. And it is an effect of the rules of international trade and finance that preclude the South from using sensible policies that would enable them to achieve sovereign development, such as the policies used during the 60s. And indeed, this is why we see that development success stories are only really ever achieved to the extent that countries somehow manage to claw back some degree of economic sovereignty uh, and use state-led industrial policy, which of course we can see in the case of China, some of the South American countries, and for different geopolitical reason, uh, reasons, the East Asian tigers, okay? But there's another reason to question catch-up narratives, and it has to do with ecology. Here's the key point. The high levels of resource use and energy use that characterize the core economies cannot be universalized. They cannot be universalized because they rely on net appropriation, but also because they are wildly in excess of sustainable boundaries. If all countries were to use resources at the rate of the core economies, we would need four Earths to sustain us. 
if all countries were to use energy at the rate of the core economies, decarbonization in line with the Paris Agreement would be literally impossible. Indeed, we would be cruising for a future of guaranteed catastrophic climate breakdown. On the contrary, what is required if we were to have any chance of reversing ecological breakdown and achieving the Paris Agreement goals is that the core economies need to actively and quite dramatically scale down their use of resources and energy. As research in ecological economics has demonstrated, the core economies will need to adopt degrowth policies, focusing production around human needs and well being rather than around corporate expansion and elite accumulation in order to reduce resource use while at the same time improving social outcomes. This has been defined in the literature as an eco-socialist transition. Uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics of this, of degrowth here, uh, what kinds of policies it might require, how to achieve it, and so on. That's not my focus this time. Rather, I want to take a minute to emphasize the demand for degrowth is not just about ecology, rather it is rooted in anti-colonial principles. Okay. Degrowth scholarship calls for an end to the colonial patterns of appropriation that underpin Northern growth in order to release the South from the grip of extractivism and a future of catastrophic climate breakdown. Southern countries should be free to organize their resources and labor around meeting human needs rather than around servicing Northern growth. Degrowth is in other words, a demand for decolonization. It's important to recognize that degrowth scholarship builds on the legacy of anti-colonial thinkers like Fanon, like Fanon, Gandhi, uh, Julius Nyerere, Thomas Sankara, uh, Berta Caceres, people who knew that capitalism in the global north was driving colonization in the south. And this thinking is reflected very clearly today in the People's Agreement of Cochabamba and other similar documents. Um, this one was signed in 2010 by thousands of social movements from across the global south, calling for the governments of rich countries to cease their appropriation of the planet's commons and scale down their resource use. Social movements in the global south recognize that ecological breakdown is being driven ultimately by capitalism. They recognize that it has clear imperial dimensions and they call for an anti-colonial struggle in response. Uh, it, and it's incumbent on all of us to begin to stand in solidarity with these demands. So what should convergence look like in the 21st century if catch-up development is, uh, uh, is not possible? Here's the good news. We know empirically that it is feasible to meet the needs of the entire global population, 10 billion people, at a good standard within planetary boundaries, but it requires a radical change in the world economy. The objective should be as follows. Resource use and energy use in the global north needs to decline dramatically to get back within sustainable levels and to be compatible with achieving the Paris climate objectives. While resources in the south must be reclaimed for meeting human needs with production increased where necessary to do so. So convergence should be focused on what is required for human well-being and ecology. That's it. Uh, this is a very different uh, uh, vision of convergence from the, from the dominance narrative of catch-up development. So what is this going to require? Well, it's going to require that the global north transitions out of capitalism and shifts toward a democratic post-capitalist economy. This is crucial in order to obliterate the constant structural pressure for imperialist appropriation, but it is also crucial in order to make it feasible for the North to meet the needs of its own citizens with significantly less resources and energy use than it presently uses. And neither of these objectives are possible in a capitalist economy, okay, for the reasons I've described earlier. At the same time, we need several urgent structural changes to the world economy. We need to democratize the institutions of global economic governance so that Southern governments have an equal voice in decisions about trade and finance. We need to cancel odious or unpayable debts or introduce mechanisms for safe and legitimate default to liberate Southern governments, to direct their resources toward human development objectives and to free them from remote control power by foreign creditors. We need to end structural adjustment programs and allow Southern governments to deploy the policies that we know to be necessary and successful when it comes to sovereign development, tariffs, subsidies, capital controls, nationalization, public spending, all of the policies that are presently uh, um, prevented from being adopted. Social movements in the global south have been calling for all of these reforms for decades. 
and for too long their demands have fallen on deaf ears. But here's the problem. Capitalists in the global north will not voluntarily make such a transition. Of course, we might hope that enlightened leaders will take steps in this direction or that radical social movements will eventually force them to do so. And indeed, we should do everything possible to support movements toward that end. But why should the global south wait around for this to happen? Why should they wait around to be decolonized? There's an additional option. Southern governments can and should take steps to achieve unilateral decolonization, delinking from exploitation by Northern capital, by mobilizing their resources and labor to meet domestic human needs rather than to service the interests of Northern growth. This is not easy to achieve, but insights from modern monetary theory offer pathways for how it can be done, at least in the case of nations uh, that have sovereign control over their own currency. The first step is to reduce dependence on Northern imports. And here I'm relying on several uh, um, uh, economists from the Global South who have been advancing these ideas, such as Fadel Kaboub and Ndongo Sambasia. Uh, the biggest import categories are food and energy. Governments can issue the national currency to fund a strategy of food sovereignty, mobilizing land through regenerative ecology, uh, uh, agroecology, to provide nutritious food for all, while at the same time pursuing a strategy of energy sovereignty by rolling out renewables. This would significantly reduce government's need for foreign currency and thus reduce the reliance on Northern capital, which is what puts countries in a position where they are forced to accept structural adjustment conditions. To mobilize labor for these projects, governments can issue currency to fund a public job guarantee. This would end unemployment and ensure that everyone has access to a decent livelihood, therefore achieving a major development objective that has so far remained out of reach. So instead of mobilizing labor around sweatshops for Northern consumption, mobilize labor around what is required for decent living in the global South. The third step is to build sovereign industrial capacity using tariffs and subsidies where necessary in order to organize production around meeting domestic needs as much as possible to further reduce the pressure for imports and to participate in regional trade, which tends to be much less exploitative. Now, to the extent that any of these policies are prohibited by foreign creditors or under structural adjustment regimes, which is quite often the case, governments can and should take steps to default on external debts through collective action wherever possible. This might make borrowing in foreign currency more difficult for a time, but because we are reducing our dependence on foreign currency, this doesn't matter as much as it otherwise might. Now, I want to emphasize that this also requires a transition out of capitalism in the global south too. The reason that capitalism has failed to deliver development in the periphery is because capital has to cheapen inputs. In the periphery, capital does not generally have the option of externalizing exploitation, unlike the core does. So capitalist states and firms have no choice but to try to compress wages domestically with violence where necessary. And this is why capitalist states in the South are quite often repressive of their own citizens and repressive of radical social movements because they do not have the privilege of using an imperial arrangement to stabilize accumulation. So if the objective in the South is to increase wages and improve social conditions, it is easier to achieve these goals in a democratic post-capitalist economy where, again, production can be geared towards social goods. We know from Amartya Sen's work that when Southern countries adopt socialist development policies, especially universal public provisioning systems, they are able to achieve big improvements in social outcomes, even with modest levels of GDP. Now, of course, this approach faces serious headwinds. Let's not kid ourselves. Many governments in the global South are thoroughly captured by capitalist interests. And, and the radical quorum that we had in the 1960s and 1970s has been all but destroyed. So the anti-colonial movement must be rebuilt. And this is happening right now through grassroots social movements across the global South and in several states and international initiatives, but it is still nascent. The job of progressives in the global North and of those who care about international developments should be to align with and support these struggles and make every effort to defend them when they come under attack. So let me summarize by saying this. The vision of a just ecological future is possible to achieve. 
it is physically possible to achieve. But this is not possible within the structure of the existing world economic system. The sooner we face up to this fact, the better. It's going to require revolutionary change, revolutionary transformations coming from social movements in the periphery, but also in the core in order to bring this vision into reality. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot, Jason, for this uh, very illuminating talk. I'm very fascinated by your ability to draw kind of the whole picture and, and take us through both history and current developments. Uh, and uh, um, there are so many things to talk about and to uh, ask you about. Uh, and I can also see that there are many questions from our uh, student participants out there. Uh, I think since we now have uh, only 10 minutes left, I think I will leave my long list of questions and uh, try to, to pick out a couple of the questions that uh, have been sent to us uh, <clears throat> by, by our student participants, because I can see that they have been following you, uh, uh, your talk very closely. Uh, first, uh, I want to uh, pick a question from Dorothy. Uh, there has been a slow shift in terms of using GDP as a measurement. So we started out with GDP, right? And uh, this is interesting. For example, the Human Development Index or the Happiness Index. What do you think about the use of these measures in order to promote development? Yes, no, I mean, there's no question that the HDI is a big improvement on simply using GDP as a measure of progress. Of course, the HDI also includes GDP as a major, as a major factor. And so you have to always be aware of that. I think that um, it makes actually much more sense for us to disaggregate and consider more directly what kinds of goals we want to achieve, right? Um, uh, think about the, the, the specific social objectives we want to achieve, be it better wages or better employment or better housing or better healthcare, and target those directly. And think about the ecological objectives we want to achieve so in, the, in the global north, for example, be it regenerating soils or reducing resource use and emissions and target those directly rather than assuming that, uh, that targeting GDP growth is somehow magically going to solve our social and ecological problems, which of course it never does. Uh, so I think we have to just be a bit smarter about how we think about our, our objectives in the economy. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is a question which I also actually thought about uh, when I was preparing for, for uh, this uh, event and uh, which I wanted to ask you, and maybe I can combine my question with the uh, question of, uh, uh, Ashish uh, Saksa. Uh, so uh, the question uh, of Saksa is, can indigenous peoples movement structurally challenge capitalism and pave, way, pave the way for a new world order? I think you also uh, indicated uh, that this could, I mean, this is something that is happening already uh, in your, in the last, uh, you know, moment of your talk. I was also thinking about this when, when, you know, in your book, The Divide, you have a chapter called from, uh, <clears throat> no, sorry. Uh, I was thinking about this. Uh, we had last week a Chilean member who was visiting Bergen in connection with him being awarded an honorary doctorate here. Uh, and in his uh, lecture on the universal right to breathe, he spoke about the archives of knowledge based on former ways of living and also ancestors as a reserve of breath in a way. Uh, and in your degrowth book, The Less is More book, uh, you also talk about lessons from the ancestors and things to be learned, for example, from, uh, yeah, from, from non-capitalist or pre-capitalist societies and relating to this, of course, indigenous people's uh, ways of living in, in uh, different parts of the world today. So could you say something about that? I mean, the, the potential of uh, indigenous people movements, indigenous people's knowledge uh, for, uh, you know, a different pathway. Yeah, no, it's a, I think it's a really important point. Um, so the uh, the People's Agreement of Cochabamba was actually led by indigenous movements, although it also includes social movements uh, that do not define as indigenous. Um, and it, it's worth reading, actually, because it becomes clear. I mean, if you read this text, it becomes clear that it's much more advanced in its analysis of our, uh, of our global problems than anything that passes for analysis in sort of mainstream uh, climates or political discourse in the global north. Um, so uh, I think paying attention to their analysis is really important. Platforming their demands, aligning with their demands, et cetera, is crucial. Um, and uh, but, but, but what becomes clear in their texts 
um, is, is not just their call for a different kind of economy, but also their call for a different kind of ontology, one that fundamentally refuses the, uh, the human nature hierarchies and dualisms that underpin uh, much of Western philosophy and Western economic thoughts, which sees nature as a kind of external, uh, a, a kind of uh, external zone where costs can be externalized and so on, right? So they call for a kind of a kind of non-dualist or post-dualist kind of ontology. I think that's quite important for our our, um, our analysis as well. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yes, and the question is then: Can can it happen? Can some can changes in these direction actually happening happen? It seems a bit. Uh, I mean, looking around, at least in Norway, I think it uh, it's a bit depressing, you know, the yeah. way that things are moving. Yeah, you know, definitely. after yeah, I'm sorry, I'm now uh, uh, taking over the question session from the students here, but I was just thinking about, you know, uh, COVID. Uh, you, during COVID, I mean, there was some sense of that. Okay, we we have a standstill. We are immobile can we do uh, some kind of increased sensitivity to you know the world's problems but uh, now i have a strong feeling uh, that we are back to business usual business i don't know what you think about that yeah no it's, it's quite clear that we are and um the reason that that uh, we are not able to, to make any changes during this crisis is simply because the social movements to achieve that have not been built uh, there's been a real failure to, to build the kind of movements that were capable, for example, of the anti-colonial struggle or capable of the civil rights movement or capable of the labor movements in the 1940s or the feminist movements, uh, the, the, the movement for women's suffrage, et cetera, et cetera. The, this is the scale of the movements that need to be built in order to achieve the kind of transition that we know is required for us to, uh, to transition to a just and ecological economy. And those movements don't exist in sufficient form right now. They, they really must be built. And that's not an easy thing to do. It requires work. Uh, so simply having awareness, the kind of analysis is not adequate. Um, uh, our hope for change and the possibility of change can only ever be as strong and robust as our actual physical struggles. And mm -hmm. so we have to build that struggle if we want to have any hope for the future. I think that's the key, uh, the key lesson here. Mm out on the streets. Yeah, actually, uh, to follow up on what you said about feminist struggles, I mean, uh, there's a question here from Tai Nian. Uh, how do the feminist and post-structuralist perspectives reflect the globalization paradigm? Or maybe how can they contribute to, to solve some of the challenges? This is my, the last is my addition. Mm. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting. Um, ecological economics owes an enormous debt to, to feminist thought, actually. <laughs> this is really important. Um, it was it was feminist it was feminist thinkers who first pointed out uh, well what what every woman in fact knows which is that there's huge portions of the economy that uh, are that are um, essential for our well-being uh, but not counted at all in the national accounts right so all of the care work that goes into social reproduction um, which for most of the past century has been overwhelmingly performed by women. Uh, although not, not exclusively, of course, this is basically rendered a zero value in our in our uh, um, economic modeling frameworks. Um, and so we need to pay attention to the forms of value that we rely on, which are excluded from uh, from formal economic analysis, uh, care, you know, sharing commons, uh, uh, um, nature, obviously, being a big one. <laughs> Um, not that we need to incorporate all of these into a kind of GDP framework, but, but rather we need to sort of tra uh, transform the way we think about value entirely in order to accommodate forms of value that cannot be rendered in terms of income or dollars, right? Uh, and, and that requires a broader kind of economic transformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there is also a, a provocative question here from Devin, Devin, Devin Bremer. I'm sorry, Devin, for mispronouncing your name. Uh, for many Europeans, the fact that the game is rigged and we are still imperial is considered a good thing, no? Don't we abandon humanist justice ideals before we give up any advantage? Or in what way does the inequality hurt us and our children? No, I think that it's very clear that's that uh, it's, this arrangement is bad for, for ordinary people in Europe and in the core economies as well. It's bad on several fronts. I mean, first of all, who wants to live in an economy where, uh, where to satisfy our basic needs for say clothing or mobile phones, we know that we are actively participating and are relying on global commodity chains that are deeply exploitative 
of humans and ecology. I mean, this harms us on a very deep level. Uh, I think it makes us depressed and anxious uh, and miserable. And we all yearn for an economy that does not rely on exploitation in that way. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that the very same forces that exploits the South are the very same forces that exploits labor um, uh, and human lives more, more generally in, uh, in, the northern, in the Northern core economies, right? Um, and of course, this is, this is, this, the, these hierarchies of exploitation are highly gendered and also highly racialized. Uh, and so if we want to, to shift towards a just economy uh, in the global north, it's, it's going to require, in fact, shifting to a just economy uh, internationally. Um, furthermore, the, the research in degrowth points out very clearly that a transition to a kind of eco-socialist economy in the global north would dramatically improve the lives of ordinary people and working class communities in the global north. They would have better access to the core goods they require to live decent lives, no? Universal public health care, education, transit, et cetera, et cetera, nutritious food. If we organize the economy around those goods rather than around uh, production for the sake of corporate accumulation. So th these struggles are tied and I think we have to recognize here that um, that we need to be in solidarity with one another um, against a common enemy, which is a deeply undemocratic economic system that uh, overwhelmingly services the interests of a small elite at the expense of most of humanity and a habitable planet. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this last answer. I think actually our time has run out. Oh no, it has run out. It's 10.30. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I think we have to stop here. There are many other questions and uh, I also have a lot of other questions for you, but thank you so much.